So to introduce, uh, to introduce Ian to you, um, so Ian was uh, the chief executive of, um, of SSE, one of the big six, I won't say the big bad six, but we can perhaps discuss. Um, you know, one of our major utilities companies for, for over, over 10 years uh, before he stepped down uh, just over a year uh, ago. Um, he's now chairman of Scotland's uh, 2020 Climate Delivery Group, and he's chairman of, uh, of, of the Wood Group. Uh, he's also non-executive uh, director or chairman uh, of a whole bunch of exciting sounding uh, companies with difficult to pronounce tech type names that I won't go through um, in great detail. But um, significantly for us, for many of us anyway, he's, um, he's pre he's, he, he is outgoing, I believe, president of, of the Energy Institute, a role which is being taken over by our colleague, um, Jim Ski. Now, um, I personally came uh, across Ian uh, in a number of fora over the years. Um, first, discussing the costs uh, of offshore wind. Um, rather interesting and timely in the, in the light of the government's announcements on uh, the first auction of contracts for difference. And we may, uh, we may come back to that uh, later. I also remember him very memorably disagreeing with all of the rest of the big five um, in front of... Uh, uh, a parliamentary select committee uh, discussing whether, in fact, we actually need to have uh, electricity market reform um, at all. And I'm sure, perhaps, we'll come back to touch on some of those issues uh, in Ian's talk uh, tonight. So the title of, uh, of this evening's uh, uh, presentation is uh, UK Energy Policy, Full Steam Ahead, But to Where? Um, and this will be uh, based on 25 years experience in the energy industry. I think it's going to be a frank and frankly highly entertaining uh, look at UK energy policy uh, and, and this kind of critical review of what's been happening uh, and where it might go from here. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much much, Robin, and good evening, everyone. I wonder if you've ever Googled yourself. Um, now, I know that's a bit strange, but if you Google Ian Marchant, you find about half the top ten references to this guy with unruly hair who works in the energy industry. Uh, the other half are about a bald author. Um, for some reason, the slides don't seem to want to work. Um, so I don't know whether anybody wants to sort that out. But um, So yeah, the other half are about a bald author who has written a book called The Longest Crawl. Now, The Longest Crawl, I have actually read this book because when you find someone with your same name as an author, you, you can't help but... Yeah, but we'll see whether it works again in a minute. Don't go all the way up the back. Sit there. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, this is the other Ian March, the book about Longest Crawl. It's about a pub crawl from the Scilly Isles to Shetland. Okay? I'm afraid your lecture tonight is the boring one, <laughs> the energy one. But that, so that got me thinking. Tonight's the Dennis Anderson lecture. So I Googled Dennis Anderson. And I discovered that he is, in fact, a competitive monster truck driver. <laughs> now, I did wonder why on earth I've been invited to give a speech about monster truck driving. But it did give me the inspiration for a lecture on the subject that Professor Dennis Anderson, who we are uh, remembering, would have appreciated, UK energy policy. And I'm going to take the theme of driving and a journey, because we are on an incredible energy journey but we are charging ahead like that competitive monster truck driver. And I can see a number of problems on the journey. I'm going to start with four problems that I think affect the whole of the energy industry. Then I'm going to look at the components. The first problem we have is we haven't actually decided where we're going. We can't set the sat-nav. And I don't know about you, but it would be rare for me to start a journey 
not knowing where I wanted to get to. It affects all parts of the, oil, uh, the energy industry. Say in oil and gas, as a country, we have never satisfactorily resolved the answer to do we want to maximise short-term tax revenues or do we want to maximise long-term recovery of fossil reserves? We have never answered that. And that comes into stark relief in times of low oil prices. But in the energy sector, we have the same type of, in the electricity sector, we have the same type of problem. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the so-called energy trilemma. It's the jargon us policy wonks, or those policy wonks use, to describe the three possible destinations of the electricity journey. Ele affordability, security, supply, and sustainability. Now, up until I think about 2013, there was a consensus around what we were trying to achieve. It was a fudge, but it was something along the lines of, we don't have to worry about security of supply because we've got lots of old, coal power, old power stations, principally coal, still around. We should push really hard on decarbonisation because some of us believe it's a big problem and the others want to look good. And we'll huff and puff when bills go up and blame someone else. That was the political consensus ruling to 2013. But we can't even agree on that consensus now. We don't know what we're trying to do and where we're heading. So I would say we haven't got an energy crisis in the UK. We have a political crisis. That's just the first problem. The second problem is the driver. For a long-term industry, I find it incredible when I look back at my nearly 11 years as a CEO of one of the, the major energy companies in, this in the UK to find I had to deal with nearly 11 energy ministers. You say, how can you deal with nearly 11? Either it was 11 or, well, actually, the last one I dealt with, Malcolm Fallon, was only a part-time energy minister. So in that sense, I dealt with 10 and a half. That's one a year. Now, if a company changed its senior management that often, there would be a takeover. The shareholders would be up in arms. And yet, that's how we've managed our energy policy. But it doesn't just affect ministers. When I, 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 30 years ago, I was a civil servant for two years. I worked in the Department of Energy, as it was, the old one, based on, on Millbank and then on Palace Street, for those of you with long memories. Um, and at that time, the energy civil servants spent their almost entire career in the Department of Energy. And they would start in the coal unit, then they go to gas, and they go to oil consents, then nuclear. And as they got promoted, they would build on their energy experience. Now, civil servants move departments more often than premiership football managers change. Um, and I don't think it's going to get any better, unfortunately. We're facing a, a period of political uncertainty. We've got an election coming up. And if you do a bit of scenario planning, there are about 10 or 11 possible formulations of the makeup of the next government. Minority, majority coalitions. There's about 10 or 11, depending on, on what you think. So I think if we did a straw poll tonight here in this room, of who's going to be the next Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, we would get almost as many answers as there are people in the room. And there is a good chance, like last time, that we get someone who knows nothing about energy and climate change, but is accommodated as part of an overall political settlement. And that's just this year. Next year, we will have a Scottish election. I, I live in Scotland. There will be a Scottish election. We will then may have a referendum on EU membership, depending on how the, 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 the UK election works. That degree of uncertainty follows on from a large amount of uncertainty over the last 10 years. V virtually the whole time there's a piece of legislation connected with energy going through Parliament. Um, and those pieces of it, legislation have generally been short-term, piecemeal, and disjointed. And that leads to my third problem. Um, 
many of the issues, I think, in energy policy are driven by the way we think about energy. We see the energy question, the energy conundrum, as actually a series and list of dilemmas and questions, each one to be met, bits and pieces rather than the whole. It's like building a car from the bits you happen to find in the scrapyard. Um, we should think of it as an ecosystem. It's a full living picture. Each part influences the other. You know, in nature's ecosystems, you get water, air, plants, animals impact each other, and, ev and survival of all of them depends on each other. And you change one, and there are impacts everywhere else. That holds too for energy as well. Investment, taxation, regulation, market design, infrastructure, supply, demand, technology, consumers, producers, they're all part of an interdependent system. We did some work on this in the Energy Institute, uh, which, as Rob mentioned, I chair. And one overwhelming theme emerged in that. You have to put people at the heart. People, citizens, consumers, producers, the people that need energy, that provide energy, that consume energy. You have to put them at the heart and have to give them a say in the way the energy system is shaped. We need a clear and honest debate about the policy options. We need more education about the interrelationships between the different bits of the energy system and therefore the real-world trade-offs that the industry faces. And we need that education particularly for those people who are driving the energy car. That, now, what happens is we get a silo mentality. It pervades the energy industry. So we have policy divisions between oil and gas, transport fuel, electricity, heating, uh, we get isolated and fragmented policy interventions in one area or another. Um, and we need integrated policies to break down the silos and to allow companies and investors to take a long-term view. So we have to build the car properly and not produce a hybrid like this. The last... Uh, problem that affects the energy industry is the unhelpful amount of noise that's coming from the back of the car. <laughs> now, what I mean here is um, the industry has become a party political football. We have announcements of policy at Prime Minister's question time. We have announcements on policy at party conferences. They are good platforms for sound bites but they are not good platforms for sound and sensible policy making. And the rhetoric that borders on the energy industry, it borders on hysterical at times. Let me give you an example um, of, of what I mean. A few years ago, some of you will remember this, a few years ago, a whistleblower of uncertain provenance uh, made some allegations about manipulation of indices in the wholesale gas market. Um, that led to a statement in the House of Commons the very next day, threats of criminal prosecutions and front page headlines. About nearly a year later, we get a report looking at this, which said there was nothing to this. I noticed a complete absence of any political comment, of any media comment. So the industry gets dragged into the dirt because of what one person says. There are other examples. Um, another example, for instance, is the debate about fracking. We have spent more energy in the UK in c on writing reports, holding debates, and publishing media coverage than we have ever produced. In case you didn't know, we haven't actually drilled a single producing well that will use fracking to produce oil and gas. Not a single one. So despite what you read in the press, the barbarians are not at the gate. In fact, they haven't even packed their bags to leave yet. So we need a period of calm, considered, rational debate about energy choices. Yet, most of us in the room might agree I am fearful we will never get that. 
So maybe the solution I've got to do is just turn up the music in my car to drown out the voices in the back. So there are my four problems that affect the system as a whole. That's not the end of the lecture because the energy car has four wheels. Uh, okay, I'm stretching my analogy, but bear with me. Uh, there are four wheels to the energy sector, and there are four sectors. You have the production sector. Typically, we would call that oil and gas. We have the transformation sector, generation. We have the distribution sector, the networks, transmission, distribution. And we have the retail sector. Okay, so those are my four wheels. The trouble is, each of those wheels doesn't know in which direction it needs to turn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at each wheel and basically just focus on one of the particular problems. I'm going to spend a bit longer of the four on generation and supply. I will briefly cover oil and gas and networks as well. Um, now, you could actually spend a whole lecture on any one of those sectors. So I'm, I'm, I am doing quite a high-level view. So the, 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 we don't know which way to point. In um, energy production, um, it's focused on maximizing reserves and production. But it has been one of the major beneficiaries of what Sir Nicholas Stern called the biggest market failure of all time, the lack of a price of carbon. We have, until the last 10 years, been able to emit carbon without any thought, any financial cost. The rise in atmospheric levels in CO2 is undisputed. UNIPC, in its fifth report, said, and I quote, warming of the climate system is unequivocal, and that human influence on the climate system is clear. Now, I believe there is a clear link between unabated fossil fuel burning and global warming. And most people who look at this would agree. But even if you don't, if you take a risk management approach, I think that would still lead you to decide to take some action. We don't know the carrying capacity of the Earth's atmosphere to absorb carbon. We just don't know. But we continue to dump carbon into it without seeming to care. A risk management approach would say, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't do all of this. We take out insurance for much less severe risks. However, those two things cause a conundrum for companies in energy production. How do we reconcile maximizing the production of economic fossil fuel whilst meeting our rightly ambitious carbon reduction targets? Now, scientists estimate that we can only put 600 gigatons of carbon into the Earth's atmosphere without triggering the 2 degrees C. But the, the carbon in the world's proven reserves of oil, gas, and coal are around four times that number. So, for instance, a recent UKIRK report was estimated that to remain within that two-degree limit, we can only use around two-thirds of the oil, half the gas, and 20% of the coal. You could, you could find that in different combinations across those three fuels. But it's of that order of magnitude. We have to ask what the impact of that will be on individual companies' net worth. We need to query why we spend so much globally on finding more reserves when we will not be able to burn everything we've got. And we need to decide as a species how we're going to use that finite resource carefully over the next generation or two. There's also a challenge to governments. There's been a lot of focus up in Aberdeen, where I visit regularly, on maximizing the recoverability of reserves from the North Sea. We're seeing changes to the regulatory and fiscal structures to get that. At the same time, sometimes in the same week, our party leaders are signing climate change pledges, which, amongst other things, seek to limit global temperature rises to 2 degrees C and commit to an 80% reduction in CO2 by 2050. Are those two policy statements consistent? I have not seen any credible analysis that tries to reconcile those. 
Um, I mentioned the Ukirk report earlier. Um, one of the co-authors, Christopher McGlade, says in that, the quote's here, but I will read it, policymakers must realise that their instincts to completely use the fossil fuel within their own countries are wholly incompatible with their commitments to the two degree C goal. If they go ahead with developing their own resources for own re UK, they must be asked which reserves elsewhere should remain unburnt in order for the global carbon budget not to be exceeded. That is a strong challenge to our governments. Let me give you an example of the practical illustration that. Tanzania has recently discovered some gas reserves. Should we say that they shouldn't even start producing theirs so we can squeeze every last drop out of ours when their per capita income is less than 1 20th of ours at about $1,600? That is the conundrum that the uh, offshore business faces. That dilemma is not being addressed by the industry, by politicians. And so therefore one day I fear that the inevitable crash will happen. So one day, I think probably in the next 10 to 15 years, we will wake up as a species to this unburnt carbon problem and we will see tremendous dislocation in, in stock market valuations of oil and gas companies, but also in the fiscal regimes of many countries, um, of which the UK could well be one. Fortune will favour the prepared, the prepared company, the prepared country. Of course, once we've transformed, once we've got fuel, we need to transform it. We transform it in refineries, but we also transform it in power stations. And it's that that I'm going to look at. And again, we have a fundamental problem over direction. So let me explain what I mean here. Um, this lot, well, actually, their, their predecessors, from about 1947 until the mid-1980s, they had, we had a fairly clear view. The state should own electricity generation. That was, and, and decisions were made by the state. From about the mid-1980s until around 2008, I would guess, the accepted wisdom was that the state should keep well away and leave competition and markets to guide decisions. But now, our politicians don't really have a clear view on what they want from the electricity generation sector. And they certainly don't have a clear view of what philosophy should underpin it. The political debate in energy does tend to the soundbite in the short term. So as a consequence of that lack of understanding of philosophy, the state has added more and more piecemeal distortions to the generation sector. And regulators have done their bit by adding complexity after complexity to the operation of wholesale markets. And that list of distortions grows longer by the month. So we've drifted into the twilight zone where we seem to think that both regulation and markets can underpin decisions. And that brings us to one of my favorite topics, EMR. Now, EMR purports to be market friendly, and yet it's one of the most interventionist pieces of legislation this country has ever seen. The Secretary of State for Energy now has around 50 different powers to intervene in the affairs of the generation market. Some of those powers are designed if the first intervention doesn't give the result that the politicians want. They haven't defined what the result wants to be. The industry has to guess, and if it guesses wrong, we can intervene again. So the government can now decide what generation plant gets built, by whom, with what technology, where and when. It's a protect, there's a pretense that it's a piece of legislation to make the markets work better. But it's not. And as a result, we're not having the right debates. We should ask, does government need all the powers it's taking? Does it have the competence and resources to make the decisions it's setting aside for itself? Are the governance checks and balances appropriate? Are the monitoring arrangements clear and fit for purpose? 
Now, I happen to believe the answers to my four questions there are no, 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 and no, but that's actually not my main point. My main point is we're not, we sh we're not asking those questions. Um, we're relying on government to pick winners. I'll give you an example. Today, why did we have two offshore wind projects and only 15 onshore? Because the government decided it would allocate in two different pots. Why? Maybe it was right, but we're allowing government to pick that. We're driving through measures that will reduce long-term liquidity in wholesale markets. When we actually say with an, in another bit of our head, we want them to increase. We, we actually recognise that gas-fired generation will, have a, will be a key part of the transition to a low-carbon economy, yet we don't think about what the impact of that transition in electricity will have on the gas market. We are concerned about fuel poverty, and, and quite rightly, but policymakers and politicians seem unable to make the connection between increasing costs on an industry and increasing bills to consumers. Now, we've seen that, uh, we, um, we also, we say that the whole edifice is not about making nuclear bankable. It is. Um, we've seen the results of the first auction today, as Rob and I have mentioned, and at face value, they're fairly encouraging. But there's a key word that appears many times in the press release, and that's could. Um, one of the commentators I've said, said the, put the benefits will only be seen if the projects are actually built. None of those projects have reached financial close. And I do, I, I, I look at some of those and say, yeah, that looks to me, first sight, a bankable project. I look at some of the other prices and think, how on earth is that going to be built? And we saw this in the NOFO regime. Those of you with longer, long memories will remember that actually the build-out rate of the NOFO auctions got lower and lower as you got the winner's curse of the auction. People bidding a price and then trying to get their problem project to financial close, and there being no contingency in their price, so the easiest thing was to pull it. So I do wonder how many of these projects will actually get built. So it's too early for people to claim victory for EMR. Now, it's all very well for uh, politicians and the media to, set, to criticize the industry. Criticism doesn't keep the lights on. You may not realize this, but actually power stations do. Um, and a lot of them are closing. They either have closed or they will close. And there's a lot of detailed modeling about capacity margins, reserve margins, um, and I could show you lots of elegant graphs and statistics. Actually, it's very easy to sum up. I'm going to quote Sir Alex Ferguson. It's squeaky bum time. That's the best way I can put it. We need to build some new power stations. That's the truth. But all that intervention and uncertainty that's happening has made waiting the easiest option. We've seen the capacity auction. That's going to mean that one new power station might get built. All of that angst and anxiety and a billion pounds of payments, maybe we'll build one. So what do I think should be built? Well, the first question is, do we build big or do we build small? I mean by small distributed microgeneration like rooftop, solar, biomass, CHP. Now, grid connected, the largest, multiple megawatts, these are small. Now, most policy development and discussion focuses on the big. And I'm going to make exactly the same mistake. And I'm going to spend most of my time on the big. But the small has got a lot of mileage. I personally think that every new build should have some form of generation, even if it's just rooftop solar. And it should be mandated in the planning system that you act, the, the, the presumption is that you will include some on site generation and you have to prove why it's not appropriate. It may not be for the whole building. So I think there's a lot of potential still at the smaller end. And that will empower people if they are closer to energy production. But anyway, at the grid level, 
is where we feel comfortable with the basic. There are basically only four choices of power station. You build coal, you build gas, you build renewables, or you build nuclear. So I thought I would try and explain those four choices and relate them to something you actually should know about, your bill. Now, uh, policy has a direct impact on your bill. And you pay for choices of those different technologies, different levels of security supply, different levels of carbon emissions. Your bill is directly related to policy decisions. Now, I'm only going to talk about cost and carbon because I can do the numbers on that. Um, and so therefore, your current bill, you currently pay around 500 pounds for your electricity bill, assuming you've got a standard consumption of around 4,000 kilowatt hours. Um, and that, the generation element of that is around 250 quid. Now, it's at this point that all the policy wonks and the academics go, oh, but it's not 250, it's 257.3 or 246. I am doing deliberately simple numbers to illustrate the broad principles. And I actually think we overcomplicate our energy landscape and language so that I am deliberately keeping high. So this is roughly right as opposed to being precisely wrong. So roughly 250 quid, which is about 210 for the black stuff and 40 pounds premium for renewables. That's what's going on in a typical bill now. And again, using that same high level approach, taking the average grid uh, carbon intensity, about two point something uh, tons a year of carbon emissions. So that's, that's our baseline, if you like. And all I'm doing is saying, Supposing we built the whole system with one of our four choices, what would those two numbers look like? Very simple analysis. I actually tried this out with a group of school children. And they got it, so let's see if you get it. Um, and I'll then tell you later maybe who the most challenging audience was. So let's say we built all coal. And broadly, taking the current price of coal, our bill would come down we would save about 50 pound a year. So you'd all be about a pound a week better off. Our carbon emissions would go up from two and a half to four. Now, I don't think that's a credible outcome given we want carbon emissions to go down. Um, so um, that's not really an option, but I would say that I think our coal stations have a useful part to play in providing security supply by peak capacity. I think the capacity mechanism is quite a strange way of achieving some of these plants staying on the system for longer, but that, be that as it may, that's not the point. So let's say we then went to gas. In this case, our price would stay about the same, with the renewable premium being pushed into capacity to actually incentivize us to build because the current price of generation wouldn't incentivize new bills. They're roughly the same. And hey, good news, our carbon's down. 40% as it happens. That's, a, that's not bad. That would, keep, that would do us okay to probably the middle of the next decade. But we probably need to get 80% reduction in carbon. So that shows very simply, gas has a part to play but a whole gas electricity system is going to be too carbon intensive in the long term. But I think it does show why gas is a key role to play. So then I'm looking renewables and I'm using onshore wind here as my benchmark technology. Um, now actually I guessed the outcome of the CFD um, and I guessed it at around 360 in today's prices. That's about 80, that's 90 pounds. Well, it was 82 pound 50 in 2012 prices. So I'm not far off. So again, I'm roughly right, 360 or a little less for 15 years, and then it would drop back to around the 250 level. So that's what you'd pay, but of course you'd get zero emissions. 
two problems with that. That's £110, that's £2 a week. That's quite a lot to pay for clean energy today. But an all renewable energy system, would, would, we would really, really struggle and would probably not be able to have the security of supply that we currently use. We can do more than we currently have, but doing a whole lot, I think that would be a challenge. Um, it is worth noting that if I'd use offshore wind, that 360 would be about 550. Using the, um, the auction prices today, updated today's money. But I think it does show, both of these show why the, new, why the renewable industry has to get its costs down, because I think that's a little high. Our, our, third our final option is nuclear. So I've taken, as the benchmark, the proposed new reactor at, at Hinkley, and I've updated it to um, today's prices. So you're going to pay about £100 a megawatt hour in today's prices for nuclear, just a little shy. So your bill's £400. You get zero emissions, but you're going to pay even more than renewables, and you're going to pay that for 35 years. And no one's been able to explain to me why the UK seems to be ending up paying the highest price for nuclear power in the world. No one's been able to see, explain to me satisfactorily why the costs for this nuclear have gone up by over 50% in real terms than when we first started talking about it eight years ago. Um, I don't believe we should be subsidising nuclear power. I think it's had long enough uh, the amount of research and money that's gone into it. And I think we should wait until the nuclear industry has demonstrated that it can build to time, budget and reasonable cost. And in Europe, it isn't and hasn't. And we also as a country need a robust solution to the storage of waste. So those are my simple bits of math. You can get your own calculator out and do that. Not difficult. Kids got it. I then said, if you had to vote for one of those four options, and I'm going to constrain your choice, you had to pick one, which would you pick? And this group of a very similar size group of uh, uh, tonight, I'm not going to put you lot on the spot yet. Maybe we'll come to that later. The group of school children, one person picked coal. And you could tell he was the troublemaker in the room. <laughs> he had that look about him. About 10% picked gas. About 50% picked renewables. And nobody picked nuclear. And say so that doesn't quite add up. Because they didn't all vote, despite me telling them how to. So I just said, the rest of you just want the lights to go out because you don't want anything to be built. But it was quite interesting. A group of uh, 16 and 17-year-old, when, when presented with those facts, and okay, I'm not presenting fully the security supply issue, a very clear preference for renewables, with gas coming a second. So it leads me on to, so what do I think? Um, I'm going to use football again. I mentioned Sir Alex Ferguson earlier. So I've got my 4-4-2. Very simple. 20% of our electricity should come from local energy efficiency and local generation, the small stuff, the solar panels on your house. Um, so we, we need to put more emphasis on that. Um, but, but we do absolutely have to wean ourselves off the addiction to um, fossil fuels. So in my view, the electricity system can cope with a renewable penetration of around 40%. Not today, but if we, we invest a bit more in smart control and in storage, we're, we're managing at 20-odd percent. I think we can manage around 40. That's not all onshore wind. It's a combination of so grid solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, biomass. But I think around 40% is about right. And then gas effectively plugs the gap. Gas stations are relatively easy to build. They can come in on time and budget. And if we do that 40, 40, 20, then we would have about half a tonne of CO2 from your bill. Your bill's about the same because the extra 
local and energy efficiency offsets the higher cost of renewables. Builds about the same, but you may have to invest something to achieve that. And you only have half a tonne of CO2. If that turns out to be too much, which is possible, then we have to prove CCS, carbon capture and storage, on gas. Um, and I think it's disappointing that after years and years of bureaucratic uh, delay, we are still at the engineering stage. The first time the UK talked about um, uh, the, the um, CCS was in the run-up to the G8 summit. Not the one we've just hosted, the one before. And they only come round every seven or eight years. And in the seven or eight years since we generated a lot of press coverage, we've done nothing except talk. Um, we need to get on with that. It's an, it's an insurance policy. So I think that that's the answer. We should combine with small scale energy efficiency, renewables we should, and gas, keep the coal stations around as long as we need them for security and supply, minimizing their, their runtime. And we should say thank you, but no thank you to EDF's nuclear offer. Uh, so I'm afraid that the confusion between markets and regulations means that one of two things is going to happen. Um, either too much capacity will be mandated by the state and bills will be higher. We'll all end up paying. Or more likely, too little will be mandated or too late and we'll end up seeing rationing either through very high spot prices or physical measures such as voltage control or more simply the lights going out. Either way, it feels that the lack of lighting could well cause a crash on this journey. So then if I move on to um, uh, energy distribution. Now, I first got involved in price regulation 25 years ago. I was part of the team. When I say part of the team, I was about a third of the team that set the original RPI MNSX formulation for the English RX Rex. So there were three of us, and we worked on it for about two months. And we had to set one number, X, 12 times. Um, currently, we have to spend, well, that's not quite a price control formula there, but it's almost as complicated. And it takes man years of effort on the part of the company and the regulators to produce a, a set of price controls that actually are unintelligible to the people running the business. Um, so we have a very complex set of price controls. And that is not compatible with the speed of innovation. This guy here, you think, what earth is he? That is Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel. And you may have heard of Moore's Law. In 1965, Gordon Moore, uh, in, a, in a paper, said that it seemed as if the power of uh, computing chips was doubling every two years. He was sort of meaning as he'd observed that trend and thought it might continue for a while. It still continued. It's held very true. Uh, so let me illustrate what that means and the pace of change that he was predicting in, in this area. I'm 54. That means there have been 27 two-year periods in my life, um, which is about the time that the semiconductor industry has been achieving Moore's law. So if I take 27 linear steps and a linear one, 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 I might get to the back of this lecture theatre. If I take 27 exponential steps, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on, do you know how far I get? I get to Perth and back seven times. And that's Perth, Australia, not Perth, Scotland. It's 128,000 miles compared to the back of this room. That's the pace of change going on in digital. And we have a complex formula, price controls that last eight years, having taken two years to set. They are incompatible. 
It also means, exponential change also means, and Moore's law is going to last for a little while longer, it also means that the change in the next two years is going to be as big as the change I've seen in my lifetime in technology. You think how much change you've seen in your lifetime, for most of you that is going to be true. And when I went to university, not as glamorous a university as this, my mobile phone was a bag of 10p pieces. That's how much things have changed. We, 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 we struggle to comprehend the differences. A classic example of the problem this is causing is, um, is smart metering. Smart metering, we're doing a classic utility thing. We're only going to buy completely proven technology. It's taken us 10 years to start a program. So we're installing basically 20th century technology. The technology industry has left us behind. As a customer, you do not want the functionality that's going on in your smart meter. You want to be able to control the heating in your home. You want to be able to control the lighting in your home. Your smart meter does not give that. So we're going to spend billions of pounds installing technology that is already out of date. And that's the car crash that I think is going to happen. I know it's not in networks, but it, it's relevant to networks. And the final wheel is the energy supply wheel. Here the dilemma is because politicians simultaneously and often in the same speech want more regulation and more competition. That is impossible. It's like me standing here saying, I want more freedom and I want more rules. I want more noise. I want more silence. I want to eat more healthy food and I want more cream cakes and Kit Kats. It just can't be. And you end up in a vicious circle. You think that competition isn't delivering the results you want. So your solution is more regulation, which ends up stifling, more regulation ends up stifling innovation, increasing compliant costs, reducing competition. So you intervene again and again and again and again. The inevitable end result is a complete loss of trust in the sector and a competition review. And that's, of course, where we've got to. Before, I, before I, I look at a couple of issues that come out of that report, I want to comment just briefly on two themes that have emerged since that review, the CMA review, was commissioned. The first is we've seen the emergence of so-called small suppliers. And until recently, and I would say this is sort of the last three years, there was no competitive, vibrant fringe in the industry. And that allowed the large players, yeah, and I was part of that, to get complacent because there was nobody hungry driving the industry. That's not the case now. Um, in the year since that review was announced, the market share of these small suppliers has gone up from 2.7% to 8.7%. They are not small anymore. That's the first trend. The second trend, and you may not, I don't know whether you noticed this, but um, prices are coming down. And I suspect there's another round of prices to come, price reductions to come. In the light of those two trends, a growing competitive fringe and prices coming down, I don't think that today you would announce either a 20-month price freeze or a CMA investigation. I think that's just an interesting observation from the last uh, few years. So despite all the rhetoric in advance, the CMA has found no evidence of collusion, no evidence of profiteering in generation, no indication of companies using vertical integration inappropriately, and very small margin supply. They're all things that the industry, including people like myself, said on many occasions, and that got howls of righteous anger and ill-informed comment. Now, I have never been called an ilk before, but here I am an ilk. Um, that was the comment on the, on the FT on the day the 
that the CMA report come out, came out. And I think it just summarizes what I'm saying more eloquently. Um, and I can assure you, I have not had an apology. Now, of course, the CMA has still identified some potential areas of problem. Some of them about the way that regulation works, but some about the way the industry works. So I'm just going to comment on two. So if you go to the merchant household at any time at, during the course of the last 15, 16 years, you will always find a jar of Branston pickle in the larder and a stack of Diet Coke cans in the fridge. Now, you can tell me that there's better pickle around. You can tell me there's cheaper cola around. I don't care. I am a sticky customer. I am happy being a sticky customer. I have made an informed choice about my pickle and Diet Coke consumption. Um, so the fact that customers are sticky is I don't think the issue. I think the issue is a lack of engagement in the industry. So not all of those sticky customers have actually made an informed decision. And believe me, that was not through a lack of trying. As an, you, you try to engage in your customers, you want them to stay with you. But we complicate energy so much. People don't know how much they use. You ask the typical person how much their energy bill is, and they don't know. They don't know simple things like, how much does it cost to boil a kettle? How much does it cost to charge my iPhone for a year? The answer to that one, the second one, is pennies. People don't know, and they certainly have no clue of the policy decisions and the cost trade-offs being made. And if the CMA could help address our energy understanding, it would actually do us all a huge service. That's the first issue. <coughs> Second is, um, when I go to the supermarket, which I try to avoid doing, but when I go, and I go down the shampoo aisle, I am staggered at the choice. There seem to be different colours and types for hair. There's pseudoscience behind their formulation. They come in different sizes, and they invariably smell of fruit. Now, I find that totally confusing and, frankly, unacceptable. So I'm calling here and now today, and you heard it first, I'm calling now for the immediate establishment of Offsham <laughs> to sort this out, because they need to restrict my choice because I'm worth it. Now, that's ridiculous, isn't it? But that's the equivalent of what Ofgem have done with the so-called retail market review. In the spirit of making competition work better, they've restricted choice. There are now only four shampoos on the shelf. Well, except that every week they let another one in. And if and they're simply they're incompatible with smart meter rollouts, so they're, they're not, it's not sustainable. So if the CMA can get rid of that stupid intervention, another service will be done. Of course, I do know that the only bit of this lecture that you will remember is off sham, but hey. So I, I think in the case of um, the retail sector, unfortunately, the car crash has happened. And... The forensic scientists, the police are on the scene, pouring over the wreckage, trying to determine the cause. And I'm convinced that the cause is because we couldn't decide where to go and too many people have been trying to grab the wheel. Now, I've painted a pretty bleak picture uh, of um, the industry. Um, and I'm genuinely concerned about where we find ourselves. So just in conclusion, let me offer five safety measures that I think have a chance of putting us on the right road. And I proffer these in the spirit of, of suggestion. Uh, some are more thought out than others. Um, firstly, I think we need something like a, a royal commission to look at this tension between fossil fuel production and carbon targets. I don't just mean fracking, I mean conventional reserves too. We need the best minds on it. And 
we could do ourselves a, go a good service as a country to properly address this. You could ask the Committee on Climate Change to do this, but I think it would be seen as already biased to one answer. You want a genuine cross-examination uh, of this. Secondly, we, we have effectively already got a single buyer of electricity generation. But we've got it by the back door in a series of pa patchwork measures. If that's where we're going to be, let's do it properly. Let's set up a truly independent ISO. I think it should be run by the industry as a whole, uh, but with a clear short, medium and long term objectives set by Parliament and set for the long term. It uh, should not be controlled by any one organisation or any one sector. It should have contracting powers. It should have a balance sheet and it can act as a proper single buyer. And that would get rid of an awful lot of the complexity about contracts for differences. They could just be PPAs. That actually would reduce the price and the return requirement. Third solution, I mentioned Moore's law earlier. I'm going to propose Marchant's law. The carbon intensity of electricity generation should halve every 10 years. Very simple, it has a similar resonance. It's currently just over 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So by 2025, it should be 250. By 2035, it should be 125, and so on. Actually, that broadly gets us on track. Um, and what I do is I simply would impose that on all generating companies. Take wherever their starting point is and say, you've got to halve every 10 years. You start at 300, you've got to get to 150. You start at 600, you're going to get to 300. And I would leave it to them to decide how they're going to do it. So that's Marchant's law of uh, electricity generation. Uh, let's start on a simplification project in network regulation. I've called it price control unplugged. And we've got time before the next cycle of reviews to do it. So we should take our time and get it right. But the, the, the mantra should be simplification. And then finally, the last one, which has probably got no chance of happening. But we should try and force our politicians to decide for a, I've said for a generation or for three or four parliaments, is it regulation or is it competition that's driving energy supply? Either can work, but stuck in the twilight zone, oscillating between the two is a disaster. So there's a simple list of uh, safety precautions I think we should take before we go any further on our energy journey. You may have your own uh, safety precautions. But that journey that we're on en in the energy journey is important because actually energy underpins every aspect of our life. If you're not quite sure what I mean, I have a challenge for you. Try living a day without <coughs> electricity. And do not charge all your gadgets up the day before genuinely try to live, you will actually really, really struggle. In fact, I doubt any of you could properly manage it. We have become totally dependent upon a reliable form of energy. And my, so my parting wish is that we overcome those many problems I've outlined tonight and avoid any crashes along the way. So as one of the signs says there, thank you and have a safe energy journey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim Watson, um, UK Energy Research Centre. Thanks very much, Ian, for a, a really interesting and engaging talk. The, um, your points you were making about the retail market and the fact that since all the Ferrari kicked up, you know, we've had some uh, diversity into the market, lots of smaller players getting bigger and that kind of thing. And you were questioning whether actually this, uh, the price freeze or the CMA inquiry would be called today were, if we were where we are. But do you think those things would have happened? In other words, the rise of those independents would have happened if we hadn't had such political heat, whether it's about the price freeze or the general reaction from government? Um, because a lot of the recruitment for those smaller supplies happened in the wake of that furore. So I just wondered whether you thought actually the debate actually is what sparked this diversity in the market. Talking to some of those small suppliers um, as I was leaving the industry, they were starting to be uh, getting quite confident. You know, they tested their systems, their businesses. 
they were planning for growth before the latest round of uh, political intervention. I think they were growing and they were starting to have an influence anyway. What they would have achieved, I don't know, but I think that um, uh, a more positive set of interventions would have been, how can we help them grow more? And that's a positive intervention, as opposed to how can we criticise the other lot? Um, uh, so I don't know, but I think that they were growing and vibrant anyway. Um, the answer to the first question is, it's a challenge. Running an auction-based system for um, capacity like we, we're attempting to do is always going to be a problem because you will have this winner's curse uh, problem. Um, and I don't know what the solution to that is. The RO mechanism worked because effectively it left the investment decision to the companies. There's the price. Decide. Um, by, by allowing an auction, the lowest wins. And then what happens if, because there are lots of ways of uh, failing to achieve a project that you realize you don't want to achieve. You know, if, if, well, we couldn't get funding. We tried, we couldn't get funding. There are ways of not getting funding. So I don't know the answer to that question about how you would how you could get a reliable auction set up. Um, that's why I was, I'm not a big fan of auctions unless you're very clear um, how you do it. Actually, I think probably in onshore wind, the result today uh, we were chatting about earlier, you look at the three outcomes, uh, the three bigger outcomes, the onshore wind one looked quite rational. They're each smallish farms. The prices are quite narrowly together. And at first sight, do a quick bit of back of the envelope modeling, they're probably fundable. You look at solar, and there are a couple of, where did they come from bids? And then there are a couple that look potentially sensible. Then I look at the offshore wind bids, and I, I'm confused, because they are lower than I expected, but they are from credible developers who should know what they're doing. And I just say, hmm, what's going on here? Have the costs in the offshore wind industry that I thought would come down but weren't actually come down? Has the threat of the auction driven the cost out? I, I haven't seen the evidence that it has, but those bids make me think maybe it has. That's the positive outcome, that actually they can be built at that because I've missed some cost reductions. The negative is the winner's curse of the auction. They won't turn out to be fundable. Time will tell, probably the next 18 months. I was wondering how you think we're going to uh, bridge the, um, the capital problem um, and get more patient capital into this sector, given that utility returns aren't necessarily um, that high, um, and some of the innovations are going to take quite a long time to, to really get up to scale. I'm, my name's Sabine, I'm from uh, Genesis Oil and Gas, kind of um, consultancy front end and thinking. Um, my question kind of re is related, and it's about marchant law. Um, on CO2 emissions, do you think that carbon credits are the way forward? And do you think there's a danger of kind of pushing out smaller or less diverse companies if you're Im imposing a, a half um, every 10 years? If it's a small renewable company, then they're already going to have quite low... Um, CO2 emissions. Which other country, in your view, is has best tackled this dilemma? And can UK take some lessons from that? First experience I've had since I stepped down from SSE is there is a more vibrant ecosystem at the very small end. Angel funded investing. I've actually now invested in 11 different small companies, of which um, nine are energy-related, sometimes a little at the fringes. So there, there is money to fund early-stage uh, companies. There is money at the next stage. The issue is, where's the money for the, the smaller, long-term 
um, projects that, that will offer a running yield of 5, 6, 7 percent. Um, and I am hopeful that the techniques around crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending are actually the answer there so that people like in this room can all put even a hundred pounds into a small project and get a get a lending so the answer will be in that sort of financial services innovation to find the sources of patient capital because actually a lot of people want would love to earn three four five six percent because they're earning one percent in the bank so I think we need the financial services innovation to tap in and find that patient capital because I think it, it's latently there in society. <coughs> Marchant's law and the small company. Well, the first point is if you're a pure play renewable, half of nothing is still nothing. So you're, so you're there. I, I, I would want some form of trading so that as a large company, I could buy somebody else's low carbon generation. And I think that, that's it. And that you talk about carbon credits. You know, I could achieve that. Um, so if I'm EDF, I will achieve my halving by building nuclear power stations. If I'm um, a Scottish power, I will achieve my halving by um, building offshore wind. But if I'm Centrica, I may build my halving by effectively trading and buying either carbon credits. The, the trouble with carbon credits is that the leakage and the, the, the uh, um, assurance on them, better to buy traded you know, renewable energy with uh, assured uh, carbon emissions. But I, I just think there's something in that carbon emission, and I say it's halving from where you are now, keeps the country on track. Now, I should say, I thought of this five years ago, and I was from halving it in 2010, and we've achieved uh, nothing in the first five years. The carbon emission of our generation is still pretty similar to what it was. So we are actually five years behind. So I've rebased it from today. Um, and the last question is about which I'm afraid I am, uh, I've spent 25 years in the uh, UK electricity industry, UK utility industry, and the most cosmopolitan it ever got was Dublin. So I don't, because SSE moved into Ireland, I don't have a good knowledge of how other countries are um, tackling that trilemma. I would say there's some good examples, say, of building codes in Scandinavia. So the issue of there is no Finnish word for fuel poverty because the houses don't need as much heat. Um, so... Um, so I think there are some examples uh, where we can look. And again, some countries, if you have a high renewable, natural renewable ish like uh, in Norway, actually the sustainability you've sorted out without really realizing it. So I think there are examples of good practice that we can borrow, but I, I can't point to that's the country. Previously, you've said, uh something about the strategy you're having about how renewables and coal plants should be distributed. Do you think that the link between renewable uh, bioprocess plants, for example, and power emission, uh, the power production plants should be a, would be a good idea? Uh, because I'm recently doing a research project that deals with algae production uh, in order to produce beta-carotene but algae could be also used to produce biofuels and the feed that they're taking are, uh, the feed that is needed for them to grow is CO2, which can yeah. uh, come from flue gases. Do you think on the industrial scale, on the big scale, it would be uh, durable, it would be doable to be implemented? I have a strong hunch that sometime in the 2030s, we will need to fit carbon capture plants to our gas plants. I don't think we will be fitting it to coal because they will be shut by then. So we should be working out on gas. Now, I said carbon capture because although we say carbon capture and storage, it, we should be saying carbon capture and 
question mark, which is linked to the second question, because the real thing, it's a bit like waste. Um, we have, over the last 50 years, put most of our waste to landfill. It was interesting to see earlier this week that the UK's largest landfill site is shutting its doors because we're recycling more and we're reusing more materials. So storage is only a temporary solution. We should be talking about carbon capture and reuse. And you know, the basic research that should be going on in our university should be about what can we do when we've captured the carbon? How can we use it? Either as feedstock for growing algae that then can become part of the biomass energy chain, or can we somehow consolidate it into building agri? What can we do so that we actually have a circular economy of it. So I think that goes partly to answer the second question. And the other thing I would say, you mentioned bio. I think we need a proper debate. There's a finite amount of bio re resources that we have available. What's the best use of that in the energy sector? Is it in electricity? Is it in heat? Is it in transport? I happen to think at the moment, electricity is probably the least, because there are other electricity solutions. And we should be thinking about how can we use it in heat and how can we use it in fuel, in, in motor, than in electricity. OK, now I am, I am going to close. So, so, so in closing, uh, just I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank all, thank all of the EFL team uh, for all of their hard work uh, in organising uh, the lecture. I'd like to thank e tech again uh, for sponsoring it. I'd like to thank Ian. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dennis Anderson for being such a, a wonderful and inspiring man that we've named such a successful lecture series uh, after him. Thanks, thanks, Ian. Thank you all. Thank you.